without further ado, I'd like to go ahead and introduce our authors for the evening. Uh, first, Esme Weijun Wang is a novelist and essayist. She is the author of the New York Times bestselling essay collection, The Collected Schizophrenias, for which she won the Grey Wolf Nonfiction Prize, and a debut novel, The Border of Paradise, which was called the best book of 2016 by NPR. She was named by Granta as one of the best of young American novelists in 2017 and won the Whiting Award in 2018. Born in the Midwest to Taiwanese parents, she lives in San Francisco. She's one of our favorites and yours. Please welcome Esme Weijun Wang. Yay. Yay. And hailing from Los Angeles and joining us from Brooklyn, Anna North is a senior reporter at Vox and the author of three novels, including America Pacifica and The Life and Death of Sophie Stark. She's been a writer and editor at the New York Times, Salon, BuzzFeed, and Jezebel. She graduated from the Iowa Writers' Workshop in 2009. Her latest novel, Outlawed, was the Reese's Book Club pick for January 2021 and is the reason we are here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Anna North. Thanks, folks. Thank you so much. Um, that was so nice. Thank you so much for having us both. Um, I can read a tiny bit um, from the very beginning of my book, and then we can chat a little bit, um, if that sounds good to everybody. Thank you again, Esme, for being here. Thanks to everybody for coming and, and spending your time with us. Um, all right, this is out loud. I'm going to read from the galley version, which has Esme's quote in cool yellow. I'm just going to read you from the very top. Chapter one. In the year of our Lord, 1894, I became an outlaw. Like a lot of things, it didn't happen all at once. First, I had to get married. I felt lucky on the day of my wedding dance. At 17, I wasn't the first girl in my class to marry, but I was one of them. And my husband was a handsome boy from a good family. He had three siblings like me and his mama was one of seven. Did I love him? We used to say we loved our beaux, my girlfriends and I. I remember spending hours talking about his broad shoulders, his awkward but charming dancing, the bashful way he always said my name. The first few months of my marriage were sweet ones. My husband and I were hungry for each other all the time. In ninth form, when the girls and boys were separated to prepare us for married life, Mrs. Spencer had explained to us that it would be our duty to lie with our husbands regularly so that we could have children for baby Jesus. We already knew about the children part. We had read Burton's Lessons of the Infant Jesus Christ every year since third form, so we had heard about how God sent the great flu to cleanse the world of evil, just like he'd sent the floods so many centuries before. We knew that baby Jesus had appeared to Mary of Texarkana after the sickness had killed nine of every 10 men, women, and children from Boston to California and struck a covenant with her. If those who remained were fruitful and peopled the world in his image, he would spare them further sickness and they and their descendants forever after would be precious to him. But in ninth form, we learned about lying with our husbands, how we should wash beforehand and put perfume behind our ears how we should breathe slowly to relax our muscles and try to look our husbands in the eyes, how we'd bleed. Don't worry, Mrs. Spencer said then, smiling at us. It only hurts in the beginning. After a while, you'll start to like it. There's nothing more joyful than two people joining together to make a child. My husband did not know what to do at first, but he took his responsibility seriously. And what he lacked in experience, he made up for in ardor. We lived with his parents while he saved for a house. In the mornings, his mother made little jokes about how soon I'd be eating for two. During the day, I still attended births with my mama. I was the eldest and the only one who actually wanted to learn about breech births and morning sickness and childbed fever. So I was the one who would take over for mama when she got too old. When I came on rounds with my new wedding ring, the mothers to be winked and teased me. It's good you're learning about all this now, said Alma Bunting, 40 years old, pregnant with her sixth child and suffering from hemorrhoids. Then you won't be surprised when it's your turn. I just laughed. I was not like my friend Ula, who had eight baby names picked out, four boys and four girls. When I was 10 and my sister B was two months old, my mama had gone to bed and stayed there for a year. So I had already been a mama. I had changed a baby, fed her from a bottle when mama couldn't nurse, soothed her at night when I was still young enough to be afraid of the dark. I was not in a rush to do it again. 
I knew from working with mama that sometimes it could take months, even for a young girl like me. So I was happy to sleep with my new husband and still sneak off sometimes to drink Juneberry wine behind the Peterson's barn with Ula and Susie and Mary Alice and not have to worry about anyone except for me. I'll stop there. I, um, it feels very weird to uh, be doing this. <laughs> uh, we were just talking before the event about how the last time I was in public or went to a restaurant, I think was with Anna in New York. Um, but I am really excited to be here to talk to you about um, Outlawed. And I want to start with uh, a question that I love to ask about basically any book um, with any author, which is, um, when did you start writing it and what was the initial kernel of the book? And I especially want to ask because I'm curious about how you would say it does or doesn't relate to America Pacifica, which was your first book, and The Life and Death of Sophie Stark, your second book. Yeah, great question. Um, so I started this book, um, it was a long time ago. Um, and it took, you know, several years of sort of circling around the idea before I really got to the point where, um, where I felt like I was really going on it. And um, the, the kernel of the idea was I actually visited, um, I was in New Hampshire, and I visited a Shaker dwelling in New Hampshire. Um, so the Shakers were um, sort of a separatist religious sect um, in the Northeast and other places. Um, they're really famous for like their furniture and their buildings. Um, but they're also famous because they were celibate. Um, they didn't have children, they didn't marry. They would live communally, but sort of men and women would be separated. Um, and so I sort of got interested in this idea of um, like people living outside sort of, um, you know, society, these imperatives around marriage and reproduction. Um, and, you know, I was thinking about um, people living out in the woods, you know, living a different kind of life, being separatists. Um, it was also a time when, um, you know, I think that I was recently married, my husband and I were sort of talking about, you know, would we have children? So these ideas about reproduction were sort of in my mind. Um, and I started writing and I started writing and it like wasn't coming together at all and it wasn't good. And I was showing it to the writing group and they would kind of be like, mm, this is interesting. Um, and um, then I sort of started thinking, you know, I was thinking, well, like who, you know, who lives out in the woods? Like who lives separately from society? And I started thinking about outlaws. Um, and I started thinking about, I, I didn't read a lot of conventional Westerns, um, but I was reading, um, I was reading a lot of Crazy Cat, which is um, this newspaper comic from the 19 teens, 1920s. Um, there's a really great um, Gabrielle Balot essay that I encourage you to check out in The New Yorker um, that talks about the sort of um, prescience and um, and the sort of gender fluidity that exists within Crazy Cat. So the, the, it's a cartoon cat. Um, he he lives, it's, it's sort of a Western. He lives in this skewed version of Arizona. And I say he, but actually Crazy Crazy Cat sometimes goes by he pronouns, sometimes goes by she pronouns. Um, this was very important to George Harriman, the creator, and he talked about it. Um, and there's also sort of interesting, um, interesting implications in, ter in terms of George Harriman's own racial identity, which is really, really vexed. Um, anyway, so I sort of started thinking about like this idea of the alt Western or this idea of a Western that's not a Western or that's not the kind of Western that you think about, you know, who is an outlaw, who are, who are some kinds of outlaws that you wouldn't necessarily think about. Um, and then once I knew it could be kind of a take on a Western, I think that's when it started to take off. Um, in terms of like jumping off my other books, I think, um, you know, there's definitely a connection with America Pacifica, which is more sort of straight up dystopian. Um, with this one, I didn't want to write, you know, like a, like a real dystopia. Um, I wanted it to be more hopeful and more fun than that. Um, my, as I've gotten older and the world gets more dystopian, my appetite for dystopia is less. Um, but, you know, there is a way that I really enjoy um, writing about alternate worlds, worlds that aren't our current world. Um, and so this book is an alternate history. That was one way to do that. 
Um, and it's also, it's also a time, you know, it's a, it's a world in which the United States has ceased to exist. So I don't think that that's dystopian, but it certainly like represents the wiping away of something that Americans rely upon. And those kinds of situations, I guess, are interesting to me as a fiction writer to look at. So you were just talking about alternate worlds, and I think that a comparison that I've seen a lot um, for this book is The Handmaid's Tale. Um, I think that people are these days, I mean, uh, you mentioned that you are less interested in dystopias than you used to be, but um, we are living in a fairly dystopian kind of world. And so I was wondering, even though the book is set in uh, the past or the, the imaginary past, um, there are many elements of the book that have kind of a twist or a new look at actual circumstances in today's world. Um, and so I'm curious as to how you decided what parameters to set in the world that you were creating for this book. Yeah, that was definitely like a really a, a difficult process and an interesting process for me. Um, because at the point when I decided um, this was going to be an alternate history, um, one thing I had to think about was um, like, when is the split? You know, when, when when does this world begin to diverge from the world that we live in? Um, and I decided that split happens around 1830. Um, so there was a real flu pandemic in 1830, um, you know, a serious flu that swept multiple countries. It's not as well known as the 1918 one that we're now all super familiar with, um, but it happened. But obviously it wasn't as severe as the great flu that's in the book. It did not destroy the United States, um, you know, and it didn't, um, you know, kill 90% of people. It, um, you know, was something that governments came back from, if not every person came back from it. Um, so I sort of took that as my my point of departure, my point where the worlds diverge. Um, and then I tried to learn as much as I could about, you know, the real history between 1830 and about 1895 as I could, so that I would know, I would have kind of a basis, um, you know, to play with or to work on. Um, and in particular, I tried to learn about the history of the American West, um, but also about the history of Black Americans directly after the Civil War and around the Civil War. Um, one thing that happens in the alternate world of this book is that the United States ceases to exist well before the 1860s. So there isn't a Confederacy. There aren't any state governments. There's no, there are, are no large governments really in the region at that time. So I had to think about like, what would happen? Um, what would happen for people who were enslaved? Um, what would happen for people who are enslavers? Um, and these don't end up being huge chunks of the book, but they were still, you know, obviously really important historical questions that I sort of had to had to be able to know the answers to in order to in order to construct this world. Um, and I also had to know a lot about just outlaws. Um, you know, like the book, like certainly creates its own characters that, that don't have that much relationship to the real life hole in the wall gang, but there was a real life hole in the wall gang. Um, and I, I needed to learn about them. Um, and, you know, I also needed to learn about like, what did outlaws do? Like what kinds of crimes did they do and how did they do their crimes? Like I didn't, you know, starting out, I didn't know anything about like, how do you rob a stagecoach? Or how do you rob a bank in 1895 with like 1895 tactics and 1895 level of security at the bank? So all that stuff, um, you know, I did a lot of research on and, and then, then was able to depart from as I chose, but I sort of had to figure out like what the reality was first, if that makes sense. I have specific questions about the crimes, um, but I'll get <laughs> to those later. Um, I noticed in the acknowledgements that you thanked Willow Creek Ranch at the hole in the wall. And of course the novel is largely about the hole in the wall gang. So I was wondering if you could just talk about that acknowledgement. Um, what and where is it? Uh, what, where did you, what happened? Where did you go? Totally. So um, yeah, I'm really grateful to them. There, there is a working ranch um, on the site of, I should backtrack, the hole in the wall is a real place. Um, so the hole in the wall gang, um, people get confused often between Billy the Kid and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Billy the Kid was not part of the hole in the wall gang. That's a different person. But Butch Cassidy, the Sundance Kid, and then a number of other outlaws around the 1890s um, 
were part of a loose gang called the Hole in the Wall Gang. People would come in, they would come out. It wasn't like a like a rigorous structure, um, but they had a hideout. It's in Wyoming. Um, it's called the Hole in the Wall. It's in, um, you know, there's sort of a, a ridge of red mountains whose name escapes me. Um, but in within that ridge, there's sort of like a notch. And the strength of this notch is that if you go and sit in it, then you can see the whole valley. So you can see if someone's about to attack you. And like, presumably someone wouldn't come over the top and attack you because that would be like really hard to get over the mountains. Anyway, so this was like very advantageous for outlaws because they can have this perch where they could see all around them. Um, and not at the notch itself, but in the valley. Um, there's still a ranch to this day. You can visit it. Um, and there came a point in writing this book where I knew I wasn't going to be able to finish it or be, it was going to be very hard to finish it without actually going there um, or at least going to Wyoming and, and seeing, you know, roughly the territory that I was trying to write about. Um, so I started calling and emailing the Willow Creek Ranch and they, as, as I remember, they weren't like super easy to get in touch with. Um, you know, they're far, they're, they're far out. Um, they're not that close to any cities. Um, I think they still had maybe an answering machine. Um, but I did finally get in touch with them and they were like, yeah, feel free to come. I didn't stay there. Um, like I didn't like sleep there. Um, but my husband and I traveled to Wyoming. We stayed in a hotel. We drove out to the ranch. They, um, they were like out, but they'd left us these directions to get to the hole in the wall. And they were like really fearsome. It was like, um, go, go left, like do not go right. Bad things will happen. <laughs> like, just, like doom lies this way. Um, and like that turned out to be correct. Like it was actually very scary um, that like, you know, just like very, the roads are really poorly maintained. Um, there were a number of times when we thought we might run out of gas and just be stuck there. There was nobody around. Um, that part was like good, good preparation for writing about deserted open spaces. Um, but yeah, huge shout out to the Willow Creek Ranch. It's very beautiful there. Um, they were an enormous help. It was really, it was really nice of them to just let me come and to give me nice directions. Um, and I'm super grateful. It reminds me of the directions. I have um, two friends who both ran the Iditarod and the, the directions for the Iditarod are very similar to that. It's like, go this way. If you go this way, like the, the steps of doom will, you know, the blah, blah, blah. Anyway, um, uh, did you tell them what you were working on um, when you asked if you could come visit? Uh, were they aware of your project um, when you decided to come out? Yeah, I did. I mean, I told them, I don't know that I gave them like a plot summary or anything, but I told them like, I'm working on a novel. It's set in this area. I'd really love to see the area. Um, I think I sent them like a link to my website. Like there were a few different people who were strangers to me, but I reached out to them and said like, listen, I'm a novelist. I'm doing this research for the book. Um, I'd love to, I'd, I'd love to talk to you or I'd love to visit. Um, and in some cases, you know, when like, when I had to like, you know, have a long conversation with someone, it was kind of a different thing. But in this case, I sort of was just like, can I, can I show up? Is that okay? Um, and yeah, they were nice about it. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm not sure if like it would have mattered what my project was, um, if I'd been a photographer or whatever, you know, um, but, um, but yeah, I did tell them. I just find that very interesting. And like, I, I wonder how many um, inquiries they get from people. To, it's a really to great question. On. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, um, so uh, to pivot a little bit, um, you have a beautiful young child and midwifery and motherhood and infertility are really major themes in this book. I am curious as to whether or not becoming a mom influenced the way you wished to address these ideas and how, if so. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so um, my husband has sort of heard the story an annoying number of times at this point, but um, when I realized I was pregnant, um, I knew I had to finish a draft of the book quickly. Like I was, you know, like a decent ways along in the book when, when we found out I was pregnant. Um, but I still had plenty to do. So I had to work really fast. I was like, okay, I need to get as much done in 40 weeks as possible. Um, and then I was really pretty close. Like, I think I probably only had about a week left of work. 
and then and then my son was born a week early um so lots of things were not prepared like his bassinet wasn't built like anything and i wasn't done with the book um and then that week's worth of work probably took like six months after that for for obvious reasons um and it definitely um Definitely it affected like the way that I reread the book. So when I was reading it back for copy edits and sort of, you know, um, I mean, I guess like I had a full, a full real edit and then also well, copy edits are also real, but we'll say a, a substance edit and then a copy edit when I was when I was sort of reading it back through, um, you know, like I don't think the book is too harrowing, but there are certainly a lot of discussion of infant mortality and maternal mortality. Um, and those parts were not particularly difficult to write before I had a child. And then after I had a child, they were like really hard to read. Um, and, but I think like if, if, it, if anything changed in the content at all, it's just that I, I had an even greater respect for what midwives do and for anybody that takes care either of pregnant people or you know of people just at any point in their reproductive lives i mean frankly like anybody who takes care of people i sort of gained a greater respect for um you know i don't think um i wrote about this a little bit in the guardian but certainly before i gave birth i didn't know what it would feel like to like i didn't know what i would want from an environment to give birth in um and i didn't know what i would want from someone like taking care of me while i was pregnant or certainly after like after i'd given birth which was in some ways much harder um and once i had a baby i had sort of a better idea of like how valuable like really compassionate care is when you're in you know what is even when it goes well an extreme situation <laughs> Um, and I also like started to learn way more about midwifery while I was working on the book, but then also afterwards. Um, and I've continued to be really interested in it and have continued to be really interested in, you know, the ways that midwives in American history and in colonial history, um, you know, before there was the United States really would provide the full spectrum of reproductive health care, um, would provide abortion, would provide birth control um, would provide, you know, would would attend at births, all, all the things, um, and then sort of were marginalized and forced out of most of those things over a period of time, um, mostly by the American Medical Association and by male doctors. Um, and the more that I've learned about this, the more angry I have become about this process, but also the more interested I've become in the history of um, you know, this group of medical practitioners that in some ways were kind of erased from history and like only now are sort of being recognized more. Um, yeah, and I mean, I still, I still remain really interested in that long after the book is finished. I think the respect for the tone of the respect for midwives and midwifery is really obvious in the book. I don't, I did not read it in other drafts, but I think that that tone is really evident in the book and it's really quite amazing. Another um, area that the book goes into is gender, which is a major theme of the book, I feel like. Um, the leader of the gang, um, the kid, is not associated with binary ideas of gender. And at one point, a character says something like, the kid is just the kid. Um, You've written a great deal about women's issues and feminism throughout your career. I remember when you were writing for Jezebel when we were in graduate school, for example. And I'm curious what you were interested in exploring about gender in this book. I also remember talking to you about another project, which you probably don't want to go into, but there was another project that you told me that you were writing that was very different from this one um, that ended up not being this one, um, but also had to do with gender. Anyway, so I, I'm very curious uh, about what you were interested in exploring here. Um, yeah, I mean, I might have, the, the thing that you're thinking about might even have been an early version of this project because it's changed a lot um, from early, early drafts, um, and especially when it was sort of more towards that earlier germ of an idea. Um, and there were directions that I tried to go with it that like, I ended up not going in for a variety of reasons. Um, yeah, it's interesting, um, you know, for uh, when the book was about to come out, um, Bloomsbury asked me to sort of fill out some questionnaires about it as I know you've done and, and, and most writers do. And 
one of the questions was um, kind of around, if I'm remembering right, it was like around my journalistic career and also around that question of, um, you know, that I had focused a lot on gender and like, you know, to some degree, if I have like an official title at Vox, it's sort of gender reporter, like that's what I, I was hired to be the gender reporter, but it's been this process over the last few years, you know, including with my editors of being like, does it make sense to have a gender reporter? Like, what does that mean? Um, you know, and then also like terms, terms like women's issues, you know, like have like the inadequacy of terms like that has become so clear. So I, I feel like, um, you know, my, my understanding of what it even means to like cover gender or to write about gender just has only become more vexed and I've, I've only like gotten like more thoughts about it and they've become harder and harder to articulate. Um, but, you know, I mean, the short answer is like, yes. Um, like I was really interested in this book to look at, you know, how people have been asked to perform gender at different times, um, you know, how they were asked to perform gender in the 1890s, how they're asked to perform gender now, how might they be asked to perform gender in an alternate 1890s, and how might they choose to perform their gender if they were in a space where they got to make those choices. Um, in some ways, like that was the most exciting thing for me to think about was um, the kid and the gang, they do create their own you know, many society that's a haven in a lot of ways for people. And within that society, they actually do, like they create this freedom for them for themselves to choose how do they want to do masculinity? How do they want to do femininity? Um, and I think um, that was just a, you know, that was such a fascinating thing for me to think about that, you know, obviously there are, you know, like there are plenty of places and spaces today that people have created, um, you know, in particular queer spaces, trans spaces, where people have carved out that freedom for, for themselves within American society, but it's it's always hard won. Um, it's often hard won. And, you know, so, so just to imagine a space like this in this particular alternate world, that was really interesting to me. Um, and then to imagine someone like the kid in that space. Um, so, um, you know, pronouns were something I thought a lot about kind of early in the process of this book. Um, and I remember talking about pronouns with my writing group and talking about the question of like, um, and this is such an interesting historical question that we can get into more, but talking about the question of like, what pronouns should the people use in this book? Is it anachronistic, for example, if they use they pronouns? Um, so now I would argue, no, it wouldn't, like, there aren't they pronouns in this book, but I don't think it would have been anachronistic. Um, you know, there's examples of using they, them pronouns going, going back centuries in English. Um, but at some point in, in discussions, one, one of my friends in writing group was like, well, it'd be kind of fun if, you know, for the kid, since, since we're wondering what the kid's pronouns are, it'd be interesting if the kid is just the kid. Um, and he sort of said that line and that really stuck with me. And I liked it because of the mythic status of that term, the kid, um, you know, and of course there are also people who don't use pronouns who use only their names. So it's, it's not as though, it's not as though this isn't something that could happen then or now. Um, and that just kind of stuck for, for that particular character and, and became something that made sense to me in terms of the kid's identity to such a degree that like, writing around the pronouns for that character wasn't even that difficult. Like it seemed, it seemed to make sense. Um, and, and came, you know, after a time really naturally. Yeah, I remember um, reading the book for the first time and noticing that there were no pronouns for the kid and being so um, impressed by how natural it was and did not seem, sometimes when a writer is doing something technical or that feels technical, it can be awkward, but it, 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 um, it's really, I think, well done. Um, there's been some exciting news lately about A24 and Amy Adams's production company producing Outlawed. And I'm always really interested in talking to writers who are in discussions about their work being produced in that way. So I was wondering what your hopes for that project are at this point and what you absolutely want to put your foot down and retain from the book at this point, at this early juncture. 
Oh, great questions. Um, I think um, it, in some ways it's easier to answer the hopes question. I mean, um, you know, I think there's still um, like, you know, I'm, I'm so excited um, about the news. I'm so excited for about the potential for it to, to be a show. Um, you know, there's still so much uncertainty in the process. Um, especially given that we're still very much in a pandemic, um, but I'm really excited. I think the biggest hope that I have, and this is something that I've been really excited about, you know, for a long time since we started having discussions about the TV rights is like, um, writing a novel, as you know, is like kind of isolated. You just do it by yourself. And I mean, people read it and people talk to you about it. Um, but it ultimately like it's, it's your voice on the page. Um, and maybe more so with this novel than with either of my others, I was really aware of the limitations of that voice for me and the limitations of my own point of view. Um, you know, I, I wanted this, um, you know, I wanted, I wanted this to be, even though this isn't the real American West, I wanted the novel to try to capture the diversity of the real American West. Um, but also I'm a white woman um, and I know that in particular like sections that deal with race and racism that deal with the history of eugenics those were some of the hardest for me to write and I really felt some of the limitations of my own point of view and some of the limitations of you know my own lived experience and um, you know just like the reality that I'm there are things I'm you know that I don't know as much about due to my whiteness um, and have to learn about. And I think um, to some degree that is what is so exciting about TV is the idea that this wouldn't just be my story anymore and that TV is a collaborative thing and that a whole group of people would take this and bring their own experiences and their own points of view to it. Um, and, you know, that they would not it's not about like making up for my limitations but would just bring a whole host of things they couldn't even predict um to the story and that's what i hope just that like you know that there's an exciting cool group of people um who are excited to approach this and bring their own strengths to it um and I guess in terms of putting my foot down, I would say, you know, like I would, I would put my foot down and say that, you know, that approach is the kind of approach that I want and not anything that would, that would narrow the scope of the book, but something that would broaden it. Um, but I mean, I think that was also like something that was clear in my initial conversations with A24 is that they were very much thought the same and were on board with that. Um, and so I'm not like super worried about having to, having to put my foot down. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think like one of my friends talks about like the outlawed expanded universe, which I think is, is a really like fun idea to think about, but like just expanding the universe of this book, I think that's like what I hope for. To get back to um, the crime stuff that you were talking about a little bit earlier. Um, to the, the crimes. <laughs> to the crimes. Um, the plot of Outlaws <laughs> is quite exciting. There are robberies, there are shootings, there are deaths, et cetera. And so I am curious as to how you approach planning the crimes that the gang engages in. And are there any weird Google searches that you would like to share? <laughs> I did at times worry that my Google searches could get me on some kind of watch list. Um, you know, there were times when I was Googling a lot about like vintage guns, um, you know, or like where, where can I shoot a gun in New York City? There is a place I did not actually end up going there. Um, but in terms of planning, like I'm actually really bad at planning as a novelist. Like I always, I always feel guilty because I always feel like if I'm not like actually writing and moving forward in the story, I'm not really working. So I always feel guilty if I spend time like outlining or doing anything. Um, but for this, I did have to do a little bit more planning than usual. And um, I actually ended up watching a lot of heist movies. Um, I didn't really watch Westerns because I was worried that I would be like overly influenced. Um, I did allow myself to watch Westworld um, after a lot of like soul searching. <laughs> like, is this really a Western? Is this gonna screw me up? I don't know if it screwed me up or not, but I did enjoy it. Um, but, but I watched a lot of heist movies. I watched um, 
Ocean's Eleven. I also watched Ocean's Eight, which is, um, you know, sort of a direct influence in some ways. Um, I watched um, I watched Hustlers. I think I might have been done by the time Hustlers came out or close to done, um, but but it is a great movie. Um, and so movies like that were really helpful, um, not just in thinking about like how does someone rob a bank, but also like the way the way that they plot and put a heist together is like very smart and very particular. And you have like the, like you're getting the gang together and like everybody has their specific skill that they're good at. And you show the montage where they're doing their skills. Um, and then there's also like the, like the bank has this one vulnerability or like the, you know, like the diamond isn't guarded between 201 and 202 AM or whatever. Um, so there's, there's like this specific way into the crime. Um, and that was really helpful too. Like, I think um, I, one of the most fun things about writing this book was sort of playing with genre and thinking about like, what are the tropes of the Western and how can I kind of subvert them and play with them? And so it was really cool and fun for me to also visit other genres while I was working on it. And like the heist is this one particular genre. Like I love like genres of movies or TV or books where like there's very specific rules. Another reason I really love horror movies because if you have really specific rules, then like you have these like these difficult constraints. And so it's even more incumbent on you to do something cool within those constraints, like a, like a villanelle or something. Um, and yeah, so I just had a lot of fun watching like people do gangs of people with very specialized skills do robberies in movies. I love finding out that you did not actually just dive deep into Westerns and watched a bunch of heist, heist, heist things. That's really cool. Um, that was actually going to be my next question, so I will skip that. Um, also, the, the element of uh, the heist, um, heists and uh, parts of your book is like what happens when the heist goes wrong or like the plan goes wrong which yeah is which is a very um I would imagine fun maybe thing to write yeah I mean that's like a really the moment when the plan goes wrong is also the part in the horror movie where the kid turns to you and goes you helped her <laughs> you weren't supposed to help her so like yeah, yeah. There, there's always that moment the false ending um and I am coming, okay, so just looking at the time, I do have one last question, um, which is kind of just like a broad, a broader question. What have you been reading these days? Are you able to read during the pandemic? Is reading hard? Are you watching a lot of movies? Uh, what, um, what books have you been reading if you are able to read? And is there anything that you'd like to recommend? Reading is really hard for me right now. And it's not even so much like I've talked to a lot of people who have a hard time focusing on books during the pandemic, which I very much get. For me, it's more like there's like the time in my day when I used to read is just gone. Like I used to, for instance, take the subway to work um, and I would read on the subway, but that doesn't exist anymore. And like there are all these like the time of going from a place to another place is gone for me. And like, in some ways that's a sign of privilege in my life that I'm mostly able to shelter in this apartment, but also like, it is, it's a strange, it's a strange removal. Like this whole like category of interstitial time is gone. Um, and those inter interstices are when I used to do a lot of reading. Um, but I've been reading a few things. I just started The Prophets, which is wonderful and, and heartrending. Um, and I recommend that. Um, I am excited to start. I have not yet started Detransition Baby or Art is Everything by Easta Murray, but those are two, two more January books that are waiting for me at my local bookstore when I have time to pick them up. Um, I mean, I think one of the fun things about having a book out, I don't know if you have this experience also, is like during the time when your book comes out, you're like way more aware of all the books that are coming out. So you suddenly have like a really long reading list, which is like pretty fun and cool. Um, I want to read Black Buck too. Um, there's a bunch, um, I'm trying to think of like the last, like the last books that I actually, that I finished that were just for fun. Um, I read The City We Became. It, it's like a really fast read, but it still took me forever to read because like I said, interstices, um, but so much fun, um, even though it's about the destruction of New York City, which seems like it wouldn't be fun. Um, it also has like that cool element of getting the gang together. Um, like in some ways, like the whole plot of the book is a getting the gang together plot. Um, so I really enjoyed that. Um, 
those are those are like a few wrecks. Um, just a couple of books. I'm, I'm excited for um, for God Save the Girls by Kelsey McKinney comes out later this year. Um, and Melissa Phoebos' essays are wonderful. Um, I read those in Galley and they're so good and they come out in March um, called Girlhood. So those are a few. I don't know. I could recommend books all day. Uh, about God Save the Girls, um, right before our event started, uh, my partner came in here and thieved my copy because uh, <laughs> I was going to be doing this event with you and was like, you're not going to be reading this right now, right? Okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> so, I love it. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading that. Um, yeah. So, okay, I uh, looked at the Q&As. Um, a bunch of them were not actually cues, so, and we're just saying hi. So, um, uh, so that was just, uh, I, I, I will not cue those because they are not cues. <laughs> um, and one uh, is very specific to the uh, plot point in the book that I feel like we should not reveal. So I am also skipping that one. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then another one was the question I just asked, which was from Kristen Page, um, who is a, a mutual friend of ours. Hi, yes, um, hi Katie. So, um, so uh, if people have more cues that they would like to cue, please pop them in the Q&A. Otherwise, I will just keep chatting with Anna, which is perfectly fine with me. Um, but I will keep an eye out for at the Q&A. Um, let's see. So I, I don't, I don't know if anyone except for me will care about this, but um, I know that you've used dictation a lot um, with some of your other writing. And so I was curious, uh, is it this, was it the same with this one? Um, and what uh, was your actual process like? I love this kind of question. I did not use dictation for this book. Um, I used it for both America Pacifica and for Sophie Stark. And I used to use it for my journalism too. Basically, um, starting when I was like 20, which is way too young, I had um, a lot of wrist issues. Um, it's like I have to hold up my wrist so you guys know what wrists are, you know what wrists are. Um, but, you know, sort of undiagnosed carpal tunnel, I think, various problems. Um, and using dictation software really helped me and I used it for years. Um, nowadays, I find that if I use an ergonomic mouse, it almost has the same effect. I can show you this ridiculous mouse that I have. It looks like a joystick and like everyone, yeah, it's really good. Everyone one makes fun of, I mean, I said makes, when I used to see people at my job, they would make fun of me um, in the office. Uh, that no longer happens because they don't go to the office. I um, used the same but, ergonomic um, mouse when I was working at the tech company that I used to work at, so I understand yeah, that. It's, it's good. It's a good mouse. Um, but for this book, my process also changed a lot because I was trying to get it done really fast because I was pregnant. And then I was trying to get it done however I could because I had a baby. So like um, a lot of edits and even, you know, some of the very end of the book um, I wrote on my phone on the subway or in notebook on the subway and then I would transcribe it um, into the computer. I still, I do like to write my first drafts um, longhand in a notebook and I did that for a lot of this one, but not for all of it. Sometimes I would type directly, like everything was a little bit more of a mess because I was just kind of trying to get it, you know, trying to get it done. Um, I've also like, um, a lot of folks who have read it have said that they wished it were longer or that they felt it ended really quickly. And, and I'm sorry to all of you, it's because I had a baby. I just like, <laughs> I had to get it done. Um, I definitely feel like it suddenly gets like more like fast. Um, and I apologize for that. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I mean, using dictation was useful for a number of reasons. Like it was helpful to have my wrists not hurt, but it also like a lot of writers will read their work aloud. Um, and it was really good for that. Um, you know, it helped me like, I would have, you know, these giant stacks of notebooks and then I would, I would read aloud from them into my computer and that would force me to think about how the language sounded and think about how the dialogue sounded. And it was really helpful, um, but it takes a lot of time. Um, you know, when I work on another project next, I'm not sure that I would do it again because now I have a kid and I don't have time. Um, but I do like encourage people to try it out because um, it's a really, and just reading your work aloud generally is like a really useful exercise. Okay, some questions have come in. Um, one is, uh, did Anna read Motherwit by 
Ani Lee Logan, the last Alabama granny midwife? No, I haven't, but I'm really interested in granny midwives. Um, and I actually pitched the story specifically on them um, at my job at Vox, and I'm hoping to write it. And if I don't, maybe sometime in the future. Um, granny mid I mean, granny midwife is, if I'm understanding right, and, and this um, attendee can correct me, um, is a term specifically for black midwives in the South. Um, an interesting thing about the history of midwifery is that prior to the 1890s, um, about half, about, I believe, about half of midwives in America were black. Um, and then the other half is mixed between, between white and some were indigenous um, and, you know, some of other races. Um, but that's a history that, you know, is not taught a lot. That's certainly like, certainly was not taught to me and it's been it's been really interesting to learn it as an adult um you know so i would love to read that book is the short version of that answer i would love to read that book um okay there are two questions that are vaguely plot related so i will ask them and then you can decide whether or not you would like to address them i will try to not spoiler anything. Okay. Um, okay, so one is, um, hi, Anna, could you kindly talk about the kids illness? Sure, I think there is a way to address this in a way that's not going to be too spoilery. Um, let me think for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I think it's fine to say and, you know, um, cover your ears if you're if you're very concerned about spoilers here. Um, but there are two characters in the book predominantly who um, who experience some type of mental illness. One is Ada's mother, and we learned that early on that she, I mean, you even like heard about it in the excerpt that I read at the very beginning, um, that she's someone who experiences postpartum depression. Um, and that was something, the idea that she would experience that was something that came to me very early in the process of writing the book, like Ada's family and and her family's characters and her family history. That was something that sort of like came into my mind full cloth a little bit. Um, and I always knew that um, Ada's mother would experience this. And so Ada would sort of have to step in in certain ways and do care when she was very young. Um, the kid also experiences some mental health issues. Um, I, I won't go too much into detail, um, and, and to some degree, I don't, don't go in too much into detail in the book either, because in terms of the time period, there would not have been the kinds of diagnoses that we have now. Um, this is something, um, you know, the way that sort of terminology works, um, both for mental illness, for gender identity, um, the differences between the kinds of terms that we have now and the kinds of understandings that we have now are something I thought about a lot, um, a lot with this book. Um, and, um, but yeah, I guess without going too much into detail, um, the kids illness was something, the kids character in general was more difficult for me to write, I think, than Ada or Ada's mother and really took a lot of, a lot more thinking on my, on my part um, and reading also. Um, and so the kid and the kids illness were things that I sort of thought about and dealt with later in the process of writing the book, but they became really integral to writing the book. And I think, I think the kids illness is integral to the kids character um and and ends up being integral to the plot too um and i think that's maybe that's all i'll say about that the other plot related question is i i also feel a little tough to ask uh but i'll let you uh figure out how you want to answer this um was the ending of the story your first choice for the ending did you have an alternative um i think i can talk about that without telling you what the ending is. Yes, it was my first choice. Um, I sort of always knew that I wanted the book to end this way. Um, so much so that um, the places where the book ends, I even made sure to visit when I when I visited the West. Um, you know, certain aspects, certain details, you know, came to me later in the process. But, um, but this is always the way that I wanted the book to end. I'm trying to, there's, there's one more thing I want to say about it. And I'm trying to think if it's like, okay, spoiler wise, and I think it is, which is just that, um, you know, it was important to me that like, I didn't want a situation where Ada find, you know, is an interloper into this gang, finds this gang, and then takes a leadership role within it. It was very important to me that that not happen. Um, and that, that Ada, 
you know, I think the gang has their journey, the kid, the kid has the kid's journey, and Ada has hers, and um, they're not necessarily the same journey, um, although they intersect for a long period of time. So, um, so yeah, I think that's part of why the, the book has the ending that it has, and why I kind of always wanted it to have that type of ending. I think that didn't spoil anything. <laughs> okay, um, this uh, last question that we have here, although we probably have time for one or two more questions if you want to pop questions into the Q&A. Um, I'm a big fan of Yellowstone. Just wondered if you've seen it and what your thoughts are about how it fits into or not the Western genre. Oh man, I was... I was listening to this whole question thinking it was about the National Park and like getting really <laughs> excited to, to just give my thoughts on Yellowstone National Park. Um, I have not seen what I do understand is a television show. Um, no, I haven't seen it. I'm still like a tiny bit avoidant around Westerns. I started reading more of them um, after I finished this book. And I mean, that does bring me to some more wrecks. Like How Much of These Hills is Gold is a really beautiful book that I love a lot. Um, and then there's also, there's two other sort of alt Westerns that I recommend. Um, one is called In the Distance by Hernan Diaz, um, which is like one of the weirdest books I've ever read um, about a Swedish immigrant who becomes a giant and then wanders around America for like about 50 years. <laughs> it's just so, that sounds bad, but it's so good. I did a bad job of explaining what is an amazing novel. Um, and then Teo Obrett's Inland also um, is kind of an alt Western um, that I enjoyed, but I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't watched Yellowstone. I might. Um, I, I will say that I, I enjoy Yellowstone National Park. Um, and I think it's like, it's, it's, this is my review of Yellowstone National Park. It's definitely one of those national parks in the West that's like very, um, there's a lot of like pavement. I mean, Yosemite and Yellowstone are like this. There's a lot of pavement there. It's very like built up. Um, but it's also really beautiful and I miss those landscapes a lot. I mean, I'm not, I'm not from Wyoming. I'm from California. Um, I hope, I hope you're enjoying it. It's, it's had a really hard year, <laughs> um, as has everywhere. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm homesick for, for the West and I haven't been back there in too long. Um, but, um, no, I'm, I'm eager to hear other people's opinions of, of TV show Yellowstone and of, of other, I, I know there's, um, there's been a couple of, of, um, TV Westerns too recently. I also haven't watched Godless, um, although I hear it's good. I was going to ask you what your uh, thoughts of Yellowstone, the National Park, were if, if you did not go ahead and do that. So I'm glad you did. Um, I think we have time for probably one last question. Um, and this is, uh, if you could recommend one town, place, or location that you visited for this book, where would it be? Oh, wow. Um, I mean, I'm going to cheat a little bit and recommend two. So the town of Casey, Wyoming is really fascinating. Um, I almost hate to characterize it too much. Um, you know, like, I think sometimes, sometimes when I talk about this book, especially to people in New York, I talk about like how cool it was to write about the landscapes of the West and how I miss the West so much. But of course, I'm, you know, again, I'm not from Wyoming and I don't want to like exoticize Wyoming as a person from Los Angeles. Um, but Casey is interesting in that um, it's very small. Um, it has one sort of main street with like some businesses on it um, that looks like, you know, to the outside eye, it looks like a, a Western set almost, you know, like the saloon should be there and, and all that. Um, and then it has a really strange museum called Hoofprints of the Past um, where I, I did, you know, some research. Um, they have like, there's something, some things about the museum that we can talk about off the record sometime, but um, they do have um, a really beautiful collection of brands 
like cattle brands um and that those were like a big insp inspiration for me um there's a town called fiddleback in the book that's named after the fiddleback brand which is a particular sort of beautiful brand that looks you know it looks like a cello basically um they also had like you know 19th century belt buckles um 19th century and they had some weapons they had guns um they had just like you know various like cowboying implements i mean in some ways like one of the most fun um one of the most fun aspects of research for this book was just like learning about stuff. Um, I don't feel like I necessarily get to do that in my job as a reporter very much. I'm not like learning about like tons of different types of metal implements, but like I had to learn about that for this book and that was fun and interesting. The second place I would recommend that's not like it doesn't show up as much in the book, but it does play a role as Rocky Mountain National Park. Um, just just while we're here raiding national parks, um, you know, it's it's very beautiful. Um, we went there, my husband and I, and we went like hiking. I mean, like walking, really. It wasn't a hard hike. Um, but above the tree line to where, you know, the foliage gets all weird and like kind of non-existent or just like really close to the ground because there's not enough air like for big trees and stuff, um, I think, or not enough something. Um, you know, as like someone that mostly has lived in cities, I think the whole concept of the tree line was something that was like really interesting for me to learn about. Um, you know, and then you look down like into the valley below, like we saw moose from above, which was crazy. Um, you know, we we saw we saw a falcon so close that we could see its eye. Um, just a really beautiful place. Um, it only shows up in the book a little bit, but um, in terms of places to go and, and see a bird, um, it's really lovely. So those are those are my two wrecks, I think, from research. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, I think we're we're good. I think. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Esme. Thank you, everyone, for coming. This was really fun. Thank you so much to Green Apple. Um, I so appreciate all of you. This was really great. Thank you both so much. That was wonderful. And um, Anna, I so enjoyed your book. And I'm really glad that I got to hear you both talking about it. Esme, thank you. It's a pleasure as always. Um, and thank you all for joining us out there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, I would be remiss in my duty if I didn't remind you that uh, Anna's book is available for purchase <laughs> at Green Apple Books here in San Francisco. Uh, and we do still have um, a couple of signed copies left. So uh, if you haven't gotten yours yet, uh, perhaps you can pick that up here. Um, thank you both for your time and uh, insight. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much again. All right. Thanks, folks. Good night. Good night.